stress disorder is what happens when somebody experiences the long-term effects of trauma. We also have a disorder for short-term trauma that's called acute stress disorder. Uh, and this acute stress disorder is when you experience something really traumatic and you feel very maladjusted for up to 30 days after the trauma. Once it gets over 30 days, now it's considered long-term and you roll into possible diagnosis for PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And so what happens here is the type of trauma you experienced. We don't have to learn about all the different types of trauma. That would be very traumatic, but it could be something like uh, being a refugee in war or going off and fighting in war as a soldier or experiencing a natural disaster or being a victim of violence and abuse. And so what happens is if you experience a lot of trauma, you might experience uncontrollable flashbacks and they may come at times where you're not expecting, or they may come all the time. So you're always expecting them and you're always anticipating the next flashback. And so you're constantly reliving the experience. And so this is something that we first understood with soldiers. And then we second understood with survivors of abuse. And it's the idea that they, that the really heavy stuff that they experience constantly comes back to them. And one of the big things preventing them from moving on is they feel like they need to hold the trauma in. They feel like sharing it, it would put a burden on others because they don't share it with others, whether it's their loved ones or our professional clinical psychologist, they hold that trauma in. And by trying to hold that in, they're trying to suppress it or repress it. It comes up to the surfaces often in their dreams or often in just spontaneous flashbacks. And so we know one of the big solutions to this is allowing them to express and put that burden in the air and it can help them to move on. We'll talk more about that in treatment and therapy, but this long-term trauma can be really overwhelming. It can really make someone start to not function. What I really want to emphasize here is you can get post-traumatic stress disorder from lots of different things in life. And acute stress disorder can actually be solicited by reading about trauma secondhand. We know that people that get really into the World War II documentaries or people that read about lots of things about the flight of refugees today in modern society, they can actually experience acute stress disorder from reading and empathizing with others. And that's why for the purposes of this lecture, we're going to go a little bit light. We understand that most psychology students are very empathetic individuals and you want to put yourselves in other people's shoes and understand their perspectives. But by doing so, it can actually cause acute stress disorder. And so we understand that it's actually not just uh, the buzzwords like triggering. It can actually cause a lot of distress in an individual. So we're going to go a little bit light and easy on it because this is intro psych. Now, those are considered more the classic anxiety disorders, a related type of disorder that used to be under anxiety, but is now considered its own classification in the DSM-5 is the obsessive compulsive disorders. We're going to talk about them in this group too, because they are pretty related. So obsessive compulsive disorder does come from a place of anxiety and a place of preoccupation as well as most of the other anxiety disorders. But what's really unique about it is it has two main components. And these two main components are the obsessions and the compulsions. So an obsession is an uncontrollable cognitive intrusion. It's kind of like a panic attack or a PTSD flashback, only it's not about those things. Instead, the obsession is about this uncontrollable intrusion that something's not right or I have to do something. These obsessions could be something like my hands are dirty. I didn't turn off the stove. I didn't lock the door. I didn't brush my teeth enough. Things are out of order. So these obsessions are these just obsessive intrusions of something that's dirty or wrong. And then in order to compensate for these obsessions, we have to do compulsions. These are the behaviors we do to calm down our obsessions. And so these are the ideas that if you constantly get this cognitive intrusion that your hands are dirty, you're going to go wash your hands or brush your teeth, or you're going to go and relock the door or check the light switch or check the stove. And so this is the idea that these compulsions become extremely time consuming. And what develops are these very, very complex routines. Some individuals with obsessive compulsive disorder, their obsessions completely control their life. They're thinking about it all day long. And when they go to do the simplest things like leaving their apartment, sometimes they have to turn off and on the light switch about 10 times and lock and relock the door up to 10 times. And then eventually 10 times isn't enough. They have to upgrade to 15 or 18 times or 20 times. And it becomes very time consuming. Now, all of us may experience these little quirks or these little idiosyncrasies. Perhaps, for instance, when you are doing something and you're like, oh, did I remember bringing my wallet to the restaurant? You'll check it. Or it's the idea that, oh, do I have this? Did I, where did I put the keys? Or you might forget if we lock the door, so you might go check it before you go to bed. That is not pathological. What becomes a clinical cutoff for this disorder is when it becomes so distressing and intrusive to our life. 
A lot of people make jokes, and we see this in pop culture, about someone who likes things neat and tidy as having OCD. And while that could be one of the possible obsessions, if you're not really overwhelmed and distressed by the mess, uh, then that's not OCD. Yes, we all tend to work more efficiently when our workspace is neat and tidy. And it can be stressful when you walk home after work and all of a sudden your apartment or your home is very, very, very messy. That mess can be stressful to anyone. But the difference here is OCD individuals, it's not necessarily mess. It could just be something slightly out of order, a pen that's on a desk that's maybe a little bit crooked. Could be enough that could provide them with a lot of obsession and distress over it. And so that's really the difference between OCD and more typical populations who just like things in order. And the last anxiety related disorder we're going to talk about was previously a subtype of OCD, but it's now considered its own disorder in the DSM-5. And this is hoarding disorder. It was previously considered a subtype of OCD because it was thought that people had to keep everything in order, but it's not really much about the order. Hoarding disorder is when you feel a lot of distress over losing things. But these are not things that have a lot of value. They're not mint baseball cards or collector items that you can trade in that you've invested in. This tends to be when you're hoarding things that simply have almost no value. We tend to see people really keep old magazines or newspapers or receipts or things that almost have little to no value. Now, there is a difference between hoarding disorder and just busy clutter. Busy clutter can happen if you are just struggling with your work-life balance and you don't have time to clean up and there's you know just a closet that has lots of random stuff in it and you need to get through it. That's not hoarding disorder. That's the idea that you just have a busy life and maybe you don't have time to clean up the clutter. Hoarding disorder is when someone's home becomes absolutely jam-packed with items. Almost every room in their home, whether it's the kitchen, the living room, sometimes even the bathroom, becomes stacked with boxes or stacked with items that they obsessively want to keep and it's hard for them to let go of. And maybe, maybe they want to let go of, but they just can't seem to bring themselves to do it because when they go to do it, they feel very overwhelmed and fatigued at the idea of letting it go. And so what's really important is this clutter becomes so problematic and interferes with their daily life. This might be a person whose bedroom is just a ginormous stack of boxes and they can barely wiggle their way to the mattress. This is the idea that you can't use certain sectors of your home because you completely pack them with, with items. And we find that a lot of these items are often things that you're never going to use again. It's not things you're holding on just for sentimental need. It's things that you're holding on because you just can't even understand the idea of letting it go. And we see some people who they might keep this to just one level of their house. Maybe it's just their basement, but perhaps they had a large basement with a large family room and now they can't even enter that room. Or some individuals let it spread throughout the whole home. And so it comes in lots of different versions. But the idea that they're retaining items that have no value, and it's not because those items have sentimental value. They could just be random envelopes, random receipts that they absolutely don't need. So that's hoarding disorder. All right, so we talked about the anxiety disorders, which are the most prevalent we're gonna talk about in this unit. Up next, we'll talk about mood disorders.